Good morning. Welcome to Ridge Chapel. It's good to have you all here today. I do have a couple of announcements that I'll make you aware of if you did not see them on the slides earlier. First of all, there's a leadership meeting this Monday night, uh, usual time, 7 o'clock, right here at the church. The men's Bible study, by the way, is not 6.30. That was a typo. <laughs> I won't be here that early, I know. But it is this Saturday, 8.30, the men's Bible study. Uh, this month, the uh, uh, community care service project is paper products. And our missions are the NSU Campus Christian Fellowship. We're thankful to have the Weiningers here with us this morning. They take up the first couple rows there. And uh, Andrew is going to be speaking to us later on. But anyway, it's good to have them with us this morning. The Mints have invited us all to a spring fellowship on the 21st of April. It was on the slides, and there's a poster back there that you can look at it. I'm calling it Potluck on the Porch, but it's not really Potluck <laughs> because they're providing a lot of the stuff, the meat, the drinks, and so on. They're just asking you to bring a dessert or a side dish, and we want to have a good time of fellowship together. That's on the 21st after church. And also on that same date, uh, 21st of April, the congregation will vote to approve or accept the uh, new bylaws, which are back there on the table. When you leave or during lunch or whatever, make sure you drop by if you're a member and pick up one of those, take read through that, and uh, be ready to vote on that on the 21st. You might have seen a different date. I don't know. We were talking about two or three dates, and so this is the official one, the 21st. Same time we have the pop luck on the porch. <laughs> all right, I think that's all the announcements I have for now. I am going to talk about Kairos, but we'll do that a little later. Let's stand if you can and read our call to worship together, please. This comes from Psalm 146, verses 1 and 2. Let's read it together. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O my soul. I will praise the Lord all my life. I will sing praise to my God as long as I live. Amen. I hope that's a prayer and a promise that you're making as well. I just came to praise the Lord. I just came to praise the Lord. I just came to praise the Lord. I just came to praise His holy name. I just came to praise the Lord. I just came to thank the Lord. I just came to thank the Lord. I just came to praise His holy name. I just came to thank the Lord. I just came to love the Lord. I just came to love the Lord. I just came to praise his holy name. I just came to love the Lord. Let's be seated, please. As we prepare for communion this morning, want to make sure that you have your emblems. They're back there in the back or back in the fellowship hall if you haven't already picked those up so that you can participate during the uh, meditation time or after the meditation time. All right, let's sing together, Come Thou Fount. Come Thou Fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy praise. Oh, to praise 
Good morning. Good morning. As we come, prepare for communion. My, I like. Uh, that song just really kind of sums up our whole purpose here. We're prone to wander. You know, I'm, lately I've been studying uh, Jeremiah. And if you've read and studied the book of Jeremiah, you know that Jeremiah is coming to um, the Judah and the tribes of, you know, tribes of Judah and Simeon and Benjamin. I guess it's just Judah and Simeon. I don't know. Anyway, the southern tribes. Uh, and he's just constantly, they've fallen away from God. Their hearts have wandered tremendously. And Jeremiah says, this is what the Lord's going to do. We're gonna, he's going to crush you, and he's going to cause famine and death. But he says, if you'll just turn back to him, all will be well. And yet, what happened? No, 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 we're not going to do that. We're, we like these idols and so forth. We like what we're doing. It's kind of what they reply back to Jeremiah. And eventually the Lord does crush them. So this is a time that I think Jesus puts before us to remind us what we're here for, what on this earth, not just here in this sanctuary, but here on this earth. My verse today is actually from uh, John 14, starting in verse 23. Jesus says, If anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching. My Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. If he who does not love me will not obey my teaching, these words you hear are not my own. They belong to my Father who sent me. All this I have spoken while still with you. But the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. You heard me say, I am going away and I'm coming back to you. If you love me, you would be glad that I'm going to the Father. For the Father is greater than I am. I lost my place, sorry. I have told you now before it happens, so that when it does happen, you will believe. I will not speak with you much longer, for the prince of this world is coming. He has no hold on me, but the world must learn that I love the Father and that I do exactly what my Father has commanded me. Here's Jesus saying, if you love me, obey my commands. If you love me, you will be glad that I am leaving. This is what we're coming to, I guess, celebrate and remember. Jesus had to leave. Why? To pay our price. Now, what more could he do for us? I mean, but he gave us more. He gave us the spirit to guide us and lead us. So as we take this communion, let's remember why we're here. To just give praise to Jesus and to recommit ourselves to following him in all that we do and say, going out and sharing this with the world, right? Let's pray. Oh, our gracious Father and our Lord Jesus, we just come before you and just thank you. Thank you for this reminder that you set before us that we can come and remember all that you have done and all that you are and most of all, how you redeem us through the sacrifice of your blood and your body. Thank you in your son's name. So now together, let's take the bread, remembering Jesus' life for us. And the cup, remembering his death, his blood, that washes us clean. Praise be to God.
So you feel blessed this morning? Yes. All right. Well, the next song tells us what we're supposed to do about it. <laughs> Make me a blessing to others is what it says. Let's sing it together as a prayer. Out in the highways and byways of life, many are weary and sad. Carry the sunshine where darkness is bright, making the sorrowing glad. a little high there, didn't it? <laughs> Before Andrew comes up and speaks this morning, <laughs> yeah, the piano made it, even if we didn't. <laughs> Before Andrew comes up, I wanted to l let you know just a little bit about this mission that we support. CCF is a non-denominational ministry on the campus of Northeastern State University in Tahlequah, Oklahoma. It says here, we teach students to be disciplined followers of Jesus Christ and bold leaders on the campus, in our communities, and in the world. That's what we hope we all are, aren't we? Founded in 1970 to share the gospel at NSU in dorms and other student residences, CCF has since seen thousands of students grow in their faith and become active participants in the kingdom. We worship every Tuesday night, and you've got, you're invited. I see that invitation all the time. <laughs> you can come there and partake or participate with some of the students. Every Tuesday night in the spring and fall, we walk as Jesus did, loving God through obedience and loving others as ourselves. Students gather to draw encouragement from one another and experience fellowship. It's good to have Andrew and Esther Leininger and their family with us today. Would you greet them a little bit? So we just got back from our uh, annual Mexico mission trip, and that was quite exciting. If you've ever uh, ridden in a van any length of time with a bunch of students, uh, or, or your children even, uh, there's not a whole lot of difference. <laughs> At least in my van, because all five of my kids were in it. <laughs> but uh, we, uh, we took a group of 17 over to uh, Juarez, Mexico, and we were able to uh, build a house for a needy family there, um, and they were a family who were far from God, and so that was, that's really good. It's a nice opportunity to give them a chance to taste and see that God is good, because you can tell someone God is good all day long, and uh, unless they've experienced that, unless they have that experiential knowledge where they they have something to connect that to, how in the world will they ever really understand? I mean, like, okay, whatever you say, buddy, God is good, well, whatever you say, but then uh, once you've 
had a chance to experience that, all of a sudden it's like, oh yeah, God is good, like when you came and built a house. <laughs> I, I know God is good. Uh, I've experienced that. And uh, so it does make a big difference. And uh, we partner with uh, a group called the Casas Pacristo to do that. And they work with relationships uh, there in Mexico with those families. And so there are, um, there are churches there that, that Casas partners with uh, in order to, to align up who this family is. And so they get a chance not only to hear the gospel when we give them the house, but they also get a chance to be continue to follow up and have that opportunity to, to uh, be loved on by a church family there and uh, be invited into the kingdom of God repeatedly, not just uh, on a one-and-done one deal. So it, it really is a neat deal. And, and there was, it's just such an opportunity for students as well because it's one thing to say, okay, I'm part of God's kingdom. It's another thing to go and, and actually be a part of bringing peace to chaos. And when they experience that, it, it's life-changing. Two of our students applied this year to be interns, to go this summer, to build houses all summer long. And that just, that just floored me. I mean, one of them was baptized just this fall. And so I'm sitting there going, okay, you know, this guy gets it, right? I mean, it, it, he really, really gets it, and it, and it was a big deal, it is, and it is a big deal, and, and we're, we're very excited for that decision, and we're very excited for that motivation, and we're happy to be a part of being able to uh, create space for God to work in these students' lives this way. And so that was uh, something that we worked toward all year long. So this isn't just a, oh, let's go do this. I mean, this is something all year long we're preparing students. We're continuing to sow good seed into them and, and invite these students to come and be a part of those things. And so uh, we'll, we, we hope to continue to be able to do that year after year uh, from, from now on. You may have even seen our video of it on Facebook or whatever. Uh, feel free to search our page for that and, and to enjoy that because it's a, it's a good deal. Each week, we gather together on Sunday mornings and try to create space for students that are far from God or even the ones that are a part of God but don't really uh, have an established Christian community there uh, in, the, in the local area. We try to make it easy for them, and we often uh, uh, attract and retain students that maybe wouldn't go anywhere else. Uh, and so that, that has been an excellent opportunity. Uh, my family and, and uh, the Berba family have, have partnered together and are continuing to try to... Uh, bring peace to chaos for students and give them a place uh, to, to really experience God in a good way there on Sunday mornings as well. And we do continue to meet uh, on a weekly basis on Tuesdays, uh, not only uh, for our normal CCF time uh, of fellowship at night, but we also meet uh, during the day. Uh, we have a collaborative lunch effort that we partner with other ministries to, uh, to bring and provide food for our students. And, and that is always a great time to, to invite people far from God and also just to continue to build fellowship and uh, continue to maintain th that which is good. And so uh, as one of the, the additions to that, this after we got back from Mexico, uh, while we were there, we experienced an, an interesting uh, thing, is that the local church there opened up their doors and provided food for the young children in the area uh, every day. And so they would do like a little brunch uh, with them, and, and the, there was just all kinds of things. And I asked the local pastor, as it, uh, we call him Pastor Joe, I said, Joe, I said, how do you feed these kids? I mean, do you, do you need help feeding these kids? And he's like, yes, 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 always. You know, like, I mean, who says no to, to more help, right? <laughs> and so I said, okay, Joe, well, we're going to try. We're, I don't know what we can do, but we're going to try to figure out something we can do. And so when we were uh, coming back, uh, we, we brainstormed some ideas, and one of the th ideas that came up was that when we gather on Tuesdays for lunch and feed our students, we'll give the students an opportunity to give, not to cover their lunch, but to help the Mexican church feed those young people in that community. And I'm telling you, these, these, stu these, these, these children and these, uh, these young people in this community, they, they, are really, they are really hard up. I mean... Uh, I mean, I don't even know how to describe it. I mean, you might see some of those uh, signs in the videos that we, uh, that we posted, but I'm telling you, these, these kids, they rough it, you know? Uh, they rough it every day. They are exposed to the elements. They're barely able to keep shelter. They're, they, I mean, they, they, they are excited about an apple, you know? And it's like, 
<laughs> you know, I'm like, oh, I'd rather have this or I'd rather have that. And, you know, it's just not the case for them. And so it's really awesome to see students get excited about helping and being a part of funding something like that. And, and, and that's an awesome opportunity as well because they uh, are, are already uh, forming habits and, and desires to bring peace to chaos, partnering with God in this world. And so that's, that's, just a, that's just been a really neat deal. So thank you guys for being supporters of CCF and for continuing to encourage us uh, to be faithful and, and, and be able to continue to uh, uh, model for these students uh, what it is to walk as Jesus did. Today, I'm going to talk to you guys from my favorite book of the Bible. <laughs> well, at least that's what the students will tell you, because I often... Uh, continuously come back to it. And, uh, you know, every time I get up to, to speak, I always say, you know, uh, all right, Genesis 1, in the beginning. And the students laugh because uh, any conversation that they have with me, typically they're, we're going to have a conversation from Genesis 1 through 12, somewhere around in there. <laughs> because it's just, if you don't start the story right, then you don't really, uh, you, you just, it's like your whole world is just set off a little bit. And you're just, you're just kind of skewed a little. Uh, today we're actually going to be uh, diving deep into uh, what is going on with the Cain and Abel story. So it's Genesis chapter 4 is where we're heading. But in order to even open up and start to even understand what's happening, this is kind of like it's, like, it's like, it's like I came up to you and said, okay, uh, so we're going to start in chapter 2, right? I mean, it's like we're, we're, not, we're not really starting at the beginning. We're starting at like, I, what, what, I missed a lesson already, you know? And so you come to class and you missed a lesson and you're going, wait, okay, I got to catch up. But yet, in order to open up Cain and Abel's story, there's some really interesting things that happen with Adam and Eve. See, Adam and Eve's story is so closely intertwined with Cain and Abel's story that in order to try to like understand Cain and Abel's story without understanding Adam and Eve's story is really tough. But nonetheless, what we're going to do is I'm going to give you guys a sort of primer to try to give you just enough information to help unpack Cain and Abel, all right? And so I'm going to, I'm going to kind of give you a, a head start on trying to understand some of the most intense conversations. Now, when I talk about Cain and Abel's story, especially with students, and I ask them, what's the main point of Cain and Abel's story? The very first thing they typically tell me is, you know, don't kill anybody. I mean, that's pretty, that's pretty simple. I mean, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out Cain and Abel's story. Like, just, just don't kill your brother. Done. Check. Moving on. And, uh, and while that is absolutely a good strategy, there is a lot of information happening in this story, a lot of information that you're sitting there going, did I really need to know that? Well, that's, that's, that seems to be a, an extra line. I mean, are they just adding fluff? Is they just adding color? Like, what are all these, what's this conversation between God? Like, what is going on with this story? Like, I don't know about you, but if you read through the Ten Commandments and it says, do not murder, but then you read just a chapter later and it says the consequences of murdering somebody is to be put to death. God didn't follow his own rules. What is going on in this story? This story doesn't make any sense. And the more you dig into it, it's like, what is happening in this story? Like, why kill your brother? All because you didn't like my, my present. I give a present to God. It was my idea to give a present to God if I'm king, right? I give this present to God, and it, it was like, but God says, ah, but Abel, yeah. I mean, like, what kind of dad does that? Like, if I, was gonna, if I had my two kids give me a drawing, right, and they come and they both bring me a drawing, am I going to go, good job, Moses, I love it, man. Jonah, do better next time. Like, who, what kind of dad does that? No, you go, good job, kids, and you take the presents and you stick them on the fridge and you put the gold star next to them and you, you're grateful. That's what the good dads do. What's God's beef? What's the problem here? Something's not adding up. And so, so there are so many things in this story when you look at the details, and then you just, you just really got to really go, okay, let's slow down, and let's try to understand this. Let's try to understand this in the way that was intended. Let's look at the details. So before we get to that point, let's start at God's beginning of a story. God, the beginning of God's story is really interesting. He says, male and female, I created them. In the image of God, he created them, right? In the image of God, what does that mean? And so right there at the beginning of the story, as God starts to unfold the world, he's creating mankind in his image. And it begs the question from the reader or the hearer in Israel's day, what does it mean 
to be made in the image of God. And so that question begins to like really churn in your mind, and you're really like just you're really trying to think through that. Like, God, what does it really mean to be made in your image and in your likeness? And the serpent comes up to, to, to Eve later and, and basically tries to convince her, like, God's just afraid you're going to be like him, knowing good and evil. But didn't he say, I've already created you like me? Like, you're already made like God as much as you were supposed to be. Like, like, but, 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 but the serpent just comes up and says, oh, you, he, God's just afraid you're going to be like him. And that doesn't make any sense either. Like, God, the, the writer is, is really teasing out this idea. What does it mean to be made in the image of God? And we, today, need to think about, what does it mean for me to be made in the image of God? How do I live like a person who is made in the image of God? In chapter 2, Adam says, it is not good for man to be alone, so I will make a helper suitable for him. And he creates Eve. Well, actually, no, he doesn't. He says, it is not good for man to be alone. So Adam, name all the animals. Wait, that's not, what? Does God have ADD? What is going on here? <laughs> like, <laughs> squirrel, <laughs> like, God, what is it? What are you doing? And so he has him name all the animals, and he goes through, and he says, okay, here, I'm bringing the animals to you, Adam. Adam looks at him, and he's like, okay, that's a goat. Uh, that's a giraffe. Um, uh, that's an elephant. Uh, I don't know what to call that. Eh, he can be a, a platypus. <laughs> like, I mean, so, so Adam goes, and he names all these animals. But in order to name an animal, you're really, you're really examining it. I mean, you're thinking about it. You're looking at it. You're, you're analyzing it. And every time the animal comes to Adam, he looks at that, and he says, this ain't me. This ain't me. This isn't like me. This isn't like me either. And he could not find a helper suitable. Like, Again, going back to what I talked about with the Mexico trip, they need to taste and see that God is good. And God wanted Adam to experience that he's not a beast. Then he brings Eve and he says, this is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. This is like me. And in the back of his mind, thinking about what it means to be made in the image of God, I should be like him. And so as the story unfolds and these things are playing out, God wants Adam to really, really know he is not a beast. But then the serpent comes along and says, no, you're just a beast. And so you start asking this question, well, what does it mean to be a beast? What does it mean to be made in the image of God? And you start to tease out these pieces of the puzzle going, like, what what is it about a beast that makes a beast a beast? You know, what is it about a man that makes a, a, and a woman that makes that makes a mankind different? And, and you start thinking, well, you know, it's, it's, it's about walking, it's about talking, and it's about all these other things. But yet this serpent is very, very human-like. This serpent is reasoning. This serpent is talking. This serpent apparently is walking based on the curses. Like, this serpent seems awful human-like, yet we are told he's a beast. And so as you begin to think about it, a beast, an animal has instincts. It is programmed by God with desires, and he will do what he's programmed to do. Like, he doesn't have to think about it. Like, he does it, right? I mean, like, you, you have a, you have a uh, oh, I don't know, a flock of turtles. I don't know. <laughs> you, you get a flock of turtles together, right? I mean, they're going to do what turtles do, you know, people like like animals are going to take care of their young because that's what they do. Some aren't programmed to worry as much about their young, and they don't spend as much time with them. And some spend an awful lot of time with them. And the more you study in biology and in science and and and, and looking at a beast, there are things that that, that a dog is just going to do every time. Like a, a dog, you know, anyway, we won't go there. But, but but dogs do weird stuff. But yet dogs do that. Dogs can be trained. They can learn to control certain things. But really, they're just being reprogrammed. But yet a man can go, should I eat? Why do I eat? I can say no to myself and and not eat. I can choose to fast. I can choose to not partake in this. I can choose, like, a man has a totally different ability than a beast. Yet we too are programmed with desire. We have natural desires, natural instincts, natural instincts to reproduce, natural instincts to take care of ourselves, natural instincts to to do those things, and it's not bad. It's good. 
Without those desires, we wouldn't, we wouldn't accomplish anything. We need those desires. And we start to discover through, 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 through these beginning chapters what it means to be made in the image of God is not simply that we lack desire. We have desire, and desire is not necessarily evil. Fact is, with all that desire and everything that is programmed into the instincts of humankind and also into the animals, God says it is tov meod. It is very good. It is very good. And so it's not that the desire in and of itself is bad, but when that desire is out of control, when that creativity doesn't, doesn't have a limit, when there are no boundaries, and as you dig down deeper and dig down deeper and you really go through all the details, you will discover that what it means to be made in the image of God, what it means to take and eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, is to basically say that I will let desire rule. I will let desire make the rules and define what is good and evil. And to eat from the tree of life is to reach out and say, I'm going to let God define what is good and evil, and I'm going to let him make the rules, and I'll let him say what I can do and what I cannot do. And so when a man or a woman decides that they want to define what's good and evil, and they want to let desire rule them, and they want to let the beast within be the boss, then all of a sudden you have nothing but chaos. And that is what ensues in Adam and Eve's story. It, it, uh, it breaks down and it unfolds with some curses, Curses that are very interesting in their nature. It's not just God being upset with mankind. These curses were actually very strategic and very precision-oriented, and they were defined and, and designed to draw mankind back to their need for God. And unfortunately, we don't have time to dig into all those details to discover those truths. But these things are very critical to understanding our story. In fact, it's funny that God, in, that, in the original story, when Adam and Eve left the garden, something very interesting happened there. They had made clothes coverings for themselves already. And God says, no, nah, fig leaves ain't good enough. I'm going to take animal skins. I'm going to make you some, some nice clothes. Is, was it, do you really think that God was worried about the quality of their clothes? But I can hear a whisper in the back of my mind going, if you're going to act like a beast, I'll dress you like a beast. So, with that primer in your mind, and with those pieces to the puzzle, to begin to open up our understanding, let's move into Cain and Abel's story. Genesis chapter 4. Adam made love to his wife Eve, and she became pregnant. She gave birth to Cain, and she said, With the help of the Lord, I have brought forth a man. Later, she gave birth to his brother Abel. Now Abel kept flocks, and Cain worked the soil. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. And Abel also brought an offering, fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. And Cain was very angry, and his face was downcast. Then the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. Now Cain said to his brother Abel, Let us go to the field. And while they were there in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is your brother Abel? I don't know. He replied, Am I my brother's keeper? And the Lord said, What you have done, or what have you done? Listen, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. And now you are under a curse and driven from the ground, which opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. And when you work the ground, it will no longer yield its fruit for you. You will be a restless wanderer over the earth. It will no longer yield its crops for you, and you will be a restless wanderer over the earth. Cain said to the Lord, My punishment is more than I can bear. Today you are driving me from the land, and I will be hidden from your presence. I will be a restless wanderer over the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. But the Lord said to him, Not so. Anyone who kills Cain 
will suffer vengeance seven times over. Then the Lord put a mark on Cain so that no one who found him would kill him. So Cain went out from the Lord's presence and lived in the land of Nod, east of Eden. And Cain made love to his wife and became pregnant and gave birth to Enoch. Cain uh, was then building a city, and he named it after his son Enoch. Tuchanach was born Irad, and Irad was the father of Mahilil, and Mahilil was the father of Methushil, and Methushil the father of Lemech. Lemech married two women, one named Ada and the other Zillah. Ada gave birth to Jabal, and he was the father of those who live in tents and raise livestock. His, mother, or his brother's name was Jubal, and he was the father of all who played stringed instruments and pipes. Zillah also bore a son, Tubal Cain, who forged all kinds of tools out of bronze and iron. Tubal Cain's sister was Naaman. Lamech said to his wives, Ada and Zillah, listen to me. Wives of Lamech, hear my words. I have killed a man for wounding me, a young man for injuring me. If Cain is avenged seven times, then Lamech, 77 times. And so as we think about Cain and Abel's story, there are so many small things that we, we talked about before that were just like, well, this is, this is a really odd story. What is really going on here? What, what, why, what, what, what? <laughs> Why would you even shepherd sheep at this point in the story? I mean, in Noah's time, that's when God opens it up. Now you can eat beasts as well. Like before this, God gave them the seed-bearing plants to eat. So why would, why would, he, even be, why would he even be thinking about shepherding at this point? It's just, there's so many things in the story that makes you go, what? Like one plus one doesn't equal two. What is happening here? What is it about Cain and his offering? What is it about Cain and what he's trying to accomplish? Why, why would Cain bring an offering to begin with? You see, there is so, there's so many interworking complexities in this story, but especially between Cain and his mother, and the way that they view God. In the, in, in, in the Hebrew, it's a little more obvious by the way that the, word, the Hebrew words that are even used to describe how Eve was able to bring about Cain with the help of God. It, it, it actually alludes to the fact that God became more of an instrument to accomplish that which she wanted to get done. So, like, God was a tool to accomplish the purpose. But it left it in tension to where, like, who... Like, who is really the tool? Who is really the instrument through which, right? And so it, it, there's like this little interplay going on. And Cain, who is the firstborn, who sees the impressive and astounding magic of, and beauty of being able to bring forth life into this world, and yet he has no womb to bring forth life. And so he goes to the only other thing that he can partner with God to bring forth life, the land. And he cultivates the land, and he, and, he, and he nurtures the land, and he gives it everything that it needs in order to produce something with God that is absolutely phenomenal, this produce of the land, this crop. And, and, and he gets some of that, and he thinks, I, I need this partnership with God. And that was one of the most interesting things of the curses, like, cursed is the ground, it will you know, produce thorns and thistles, and you'll have to have hard work in, in cultivating the land so that it can produce and you can eat of its fruit. And so Adam experienced that, and, and, and Cain is experiencing that, and he's trying to be like Dad. Sorry, I was trying to spare you there. He's tr- Cain is trying to be like Dad, and he, wa- he, wants to, he wants to get the full experience, and he, and he wants to be like Mom and be able to produce something that is valuable and good. And he needs God to do that. He needs God to help the weather to be just right so that the things are, or, or the rain comes down and, and provides the nourishment and the water that it needs for the, for the plants to, to actually grow and have a good crop. He can't make the grass grow. Like, he's waiting, he has to wait on God to grow the grass. So he wants to keep God happy. You see, this is a really interesting thing. Stepping back for a minute, you know, Jeremiah was mentioned this morning, right? Like, what is, it, what is so enticing about idolatry? 
What is so enticing about, about serving and, and bowing down to these, to these little stone statues? What is, why would anyone want to do that? Well, you don't have to think very hard or very long. I do this, the God does this. I do this, the God does this. So stepping back into what's happening here, God doesn't like to be interacted with like an idol. God doesn't like to be dealt with in such a way where, I, where, where, you, where you're transacting with Him. God doesn't want you to bribe Him to keep doing the good things that He already wants to do for you. If you act like a beast... This was a discovery I, uh, that I, I didn't even realize was in me the other, the, a, couple of, a couple of months ago. Well, it was back in November. I started on this journey uh, doing uh, this, uh, this Discipling Disciple Makers uh, uh, study, and as I started to walk in it, because I have to do it before I can teach it, you know, and as I'm walking in this, and I start spending quality time with God, and we were, we were kind of discussing this on Sunday mornings too as we were diving through the, the story of, uh, of David and Solomon and Saul before him, like, uh, like as you look at how these men interact with God and how God at times would just go, I don't, I don't play that game. I don't play that game. And it's just, it, it really, it started to, to really resonate with me in that when I pray to God and I talk to him about things that are going on in my life and I have my list of prayer requests, do, do I pray to God in a way that is very idolatrous in nature. God, I prayed. I, 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 said, I said these prayers, and I prayed for these people. Your, your turn. Do your part. And all of a sudden, I discovered that maybe one of the reasons why God is so silent whenever I cried out to Him was because I was waiting in a way that maybe wasn't quite right. Maybe I was doing my part so that God would do His part. And it just really, it really like flabbergasted me. I, it took me by surprise. I was like, man, wow. And, it, and, and the more I thought about it and the more I looked at how I prayed and why I prayed and, the, and what I expected to be accomplished from my prayers and the discouragement I felt when things didn't go like I thought they should. And, and as I looked at it and I analyzed all those pieces to the puzzle and I had to step back and I had to go, I need to try something a little different. And, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I clipped all of these expectations of God out of my prayers. And I just simply quit. I even quit praying for anything for myself except that I wouldn't sin and that I would have wisdom. Because, like, those are biblical things that I think were there. You know, it's like, and I tried to just whittle it down to very basic things. Lifting up others before God simply because I love them. And asking God to help me be like him, like keeping it really simple. And all of a sudden, things started to really start to click in my world, and things started to click. And it's like, I, I would work really hard to try to get students to like spend time uh, doing discipleship stuff, and I could not convince them for anything to do any of that. And now, like, uh, uh, whenever, whenever I made that transition, all of a sudden, things just started to go, choo, 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 and students were finding me. I didn't have to find them. And I'd, I, 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 I'd, I'd feel the Spirit of God just go, hey, have you reached out to this guy in a while? And I'd ping that person, and they would say yes. And I'm sitting there going, well, you know, it's about time. But at the same time, I was sitting there thinking, there's something to what I was discovering there. My attitude towards God was not what it should have been. I was praying, and I was interacting with God in a very idolatrous way. And I'm telling you, my friends, it can be done for years, and you won't even know what's happening. I, I mean, 30-something years of interacting with God, and, and I realized that maybe, I, maybe my heart wasn't what it should have been. When Cain brought his offering to God, there appears to be this element of, I got to keep the God happy so that I can continue to produce the good fruit. And God says, I don't play that game. I don't play that game. If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. This is not a father who received two gifts, innocent gifts from children. If my son came to me and said, all right, Dad, I'm going to do this, but you're going to do this. 
would I, would I really, that, that's not, that's not, that would be a time when you'd go, no, I don't play that game. I'm getting goosebumps right now. I don't play that game. And then, as Cain experiences, God doesn't play this game. He's not, gonna, he's not buying the bride. And Abel has brought in something just because he loves him. And he brought the best of what he had. Doesn't say that it was really all that valuable. Does God really need anything from us? Does he get real, I mean, is it, what does he really get out of the smell of cooking meat? You know, I mean, we, we obviously get real excited, you know, we start to drool. And, but what is God really going to get out of that? But he sees the heart with which that was given, and he says, I like that. I like that. There's a lesson in this, in this story. You wake up every morning, and you give God your very best. Not so that he'll do what you need him to do, but because you love him. There are days where I have woke up and I have tried and absolutely flopped. It just, the day did not go well. This was one of those days today, actually, believe it or not. We went to go out this morning to leave and the door won't open. No, I'm I'm serious. Like, turn the handle. We are locked in the house. And I'm sitting there like... And Esther says, Andrew, the door won't open. And I'm thinking, okay, I'll work on it later. And she goes, no, you don't understand. <laughs> like, the door won't open. We, we aren't getting out. And we were just out on the porch. So, And, and for the longest time, this is, we, we've, we've realized, oh, you've got to turn it just to the right and just right in order for it to open, you know. And you turn left, no, no dice. But if you turn right, it will actually open. Well, there were red flags all through that, right? For weeks now, we've been turning it to the right because you can't turn it to the left, and we should have, we should have known there's something not quite right. But we just said, oh, the trick is you just got to turn it to the... When you act like a beast, you know, if you ignore the fact that there are things in your life that really resemble beast-like behavior where desire is ruling your life instead of the Word of God ruling your life and what God says is good. If you start trying to define good and evil on your own, there will be signs. There will be red flags. There will be things that pop up in your life and you go, I probably should do something about that. But I can get around it if I just turn it to the right. You see, that we had, we had worn the metal on the, <laughs> on the left because there was something wrong with the door, right? And we worn the metal down to where it was no longer even doing what it's supposed to do. It wouldn't, it wouldn't open turning left anymore. So then we started turning it to the right. But instead of going, why was that problem there to begin with? And investigating it, I kept putting it off and kept putting it off and kept putting it off. And, and we, just, we could still get out if we turned to the right. But eventually, turning to the right quit working too. And we were stuck. You see where I'm going with this? God helped on this one because uh, I didn't have a story to tell at this point, right? <laughs> In my life, I've been stuck many times. But I tell you, I can tell you from personal experience, no matter how old you are, it's not fun to get stuck in God's world. It's not fun whenever acting like a beast becomes so much a part of our lives that we don't even recognize the voice of God anymore and what God says is good. And we get stuck. And we become people who breed chaos in this world. We lash out irrationally. We, we, <laughs> we do, well, come see me later if you want to talk about things that people do. You can probably just look out the window or in the mirror, and you probably will know. We are unlike God. And I don't know if you know this or not, but the very beginning of God's story, he said, you're made in my image and in my likeness. In other words, you're supposed to be like me. You're supposed to be like me to this world. When Jesus tells us to to love our enemies and pray for those who persecute us, when Jesus talks so much about what it means to put God on display correctly, this, 
this whole mission of Israel from the very beginning has always been about putting God on display correctly. The laws and the rules and the regulations and, the, and, the, and, and all of the, of, of the things that you might think are just so trivial, like don't cook a goat in his mother's milk. And I mean, you, you look at these laws and it's like, I don't understand. But to them, and through the experience, they understood. And the more you study about it, the more you will understand as well that it's about being like God to the world, putting them on display correctly, understanding the right way to interact with other people and to interact with God in non-idolatrous ways. It's about bringing peace to the chaos. It's about putting God on display correctly. And, and Peter will pull this back later on and, and, and talk about how, uh, how, how the, the, the New Testament believers are a kingdom of priests, and they too are supposed to be putting God on display for the nations so they can taste and see that God is good. But whenever we let the beast rule, when we act more like an animal, letting desire make all the rules rather than letting God define what is good and evil, God takes a deep breath, puts out some clothes, <laughs> wraps it around us. Not because he's like condemning us to an eternal life of beasthood, but as a reminder this, this is not how I made you. It's a reminder every day that you put it on, like, I'm not supposed to be this way. And it, it points you back to Jesus. It points you back to reconciliation. It points you back to the image of God, being an image of God bearer. It, like, all of those things and all of the struggles are meant to bring you back, to reconcile you, to pull you back to God. This is going long, I'm sorry. I got excited about the details here. So why doesn't God put Cain to death? Because you can't restore a dead person. There there are story after story after story after story throughout Torah that constantly talk about how God doesn't necessarily follow the rule that he gave them. And every time it seems to be that it's one of those deals where God doesn't do that because he wants to give that person an opportunity to experience him in a good way. He wants to give them a chance to come back. He wants to give them a chance to repent. Hence Jeremiah's plea. Why did he send him? Whenever Isaiah was commissioned, same diff. Like he comes into it and he he says, I want you to go. And he says, but they're not going to listen to you. But he still sent him. Why? Because God had, like, it's about, he, he just longs to restore that which is broken. If you go, if you go to uh, even a part of Genesis where it talks about uh, giving Abraham the land that he promised him, but I'm not going to give it to you right now. Why? Because the sim of the Amorites and the par- uh, all of the parasites, and um, that's a joke, <laughs> the sins of all of these different people groups had not reached their fullest. Like, like, you, like, God longs to give them a chance to see who he is. He's, he, he is endlessly patient for those who are trying. Like, he just, he, just, he just really, really wants it to be restored. He wants to put the world back together again. And so he's patient with Pharaoh over and over and over again, giving him chance after chance after chance. But yet Pharaoh doesn't. Oh, that's a whole other one. I wanted to do that one too, but I did Oh my gosh, it's so, it's so intense. Like, uh, the stories are repetitive, and it, and it goes on, and it starts right here. If you act like a beast, rather than a man made in the image of God, you become a constant breeder of chaos, destruction, and everything falls apart. But yet, when you are like God, and whenever you bring peace to the chaos, whenever you are a person of shalom, when you're a person of peace, like, you will absolutely, positively be like God to this world. They will taste and see that God is good, and they get to experience what the kingdom of heaven is like. Why do we obey? Not so God won't kill me in my sleep, but because we need other people to taste and see that God is good. That's why it's so important that we obey correctly. And there is a point where God finally says, enough! And and in this story, God doesn't kill Cain, but then he talks about this idea of protecting Cain, and he sends him out, and he tells them about uh, about this idea that whoever kills Cain will suffer vengeance seven times. Well, that's really interesting in the English, but in the Hebrew and in the idea, and especially if you follow, uh, like, 
in Jesus' day, they, they, oh, anyway, well, well, I won't go there. Okay, but anyway, but, if you, <laughs> but especially if you follow different trains of thought, especially in, 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 from, from like a, a Jewish rabbi's perspective, you will find some very interesting things from the Jewish Midrash. And one of the things that you will find is not necessarily that these things were actually the way it played out, but what you will discover is that there are there are there are some there are some ideas and, and, and tendencies that the Torah seems to be explaining, and if you and if you look at it from the right angle, and especially if you are a native speaker of Hebrew, it helps tremendously. You start to notice some really interesting things, and one of the things is that this idea of vengeance seventy times is not really emphasizing as much an intensity or through which d- this judgment will take place, but maybe alluding to this idea of generations. And, a, and about seven generations later, whenever Lemech has Tubal Cain as the seventh generation, there's a midrash that talks about how uh, how, how Lemech and and Tubal Cain were out hunting in the field and they accidentally killed a person who 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 they thought was a beast. If you're going to act like a beast. And so it actually boils down to this really interesting story, which I'm not telling you is exactly how it happened. I'm just simply telling you that there is, a, there is a flavor in the Hebrew here that is trying to help us understand something that eventually this judgment does play out. But yet, there's this patience. And Lemek says, if Cain seven times, or in the seventh generation, the, the rabbis would say, or the sages would say, right? Then 77 times. But our rabbi, Jesus, has a really interesting conversation with Peter in Matthew chapter 18. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times must I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? And Jesus says to him, 77 times. Does he mean literally 77 times, or is he remezzing back to an old Genesis story with a guy who experienced a vengeance and said, hey, it, no, like, don't, don't, delay, don't delay my punishment only to the seventh generation. Delay my punishment past my life. Like, in other words, forgive it. Let it go. Like, Jesus is, is coming, comes back to this idea and like the and, 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 and pulls on the grace of God for Cain, pulls on the grace of God for Lemek. Lemek demands this 77 times. In other words, he's saying, you didn't punish Cain for seven generations. Don't punish me for 77. Like, like don't, 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 hold, don't hold this sin against me. And, 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 but, and based on that, 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 that Midrashic story, it, it even has a flavor and a sound of like, this wasn't intentional. And guess what? Cain had never... He, when he murdered Abel, do you think he knew what was going to happen whenever he did X to Abel? No one had been murdered in all of creation up to that point. And there's even this flavor of, of, of teaching and understanding that says that Cain, when he killed his brother, was astonished and horrified at what he had done, but he couldn't undo it. You see, we, we bring so much assumptions to the text, and sometimes we forget to look at the details they're like, and God's response to Cain is actually really close to what Torah says if you accidentally kill somebody. Coincidence? I think not. So this is a lot of... A lot of interesting information and a lot of pieces to the puzzle, and I've said a lot of interesting things. But at the end of the day, there is a, there's so many so what's in this. And the fact is, I have a really hard time even narrowing it down. I mean, because as you as you continue to to comb over this material over and over again, and as you really soak it in, and as you really like reflect in your life, what does it mean to be made in the image of God? What does it mean when I let the beast rule? What does it mean to let God be the ruler? Like, it's just, there's so many good takeaways here. So uh, I'm going to try to break it down for you into just a few good ones. First of all, we can't let fear make our decisions for us. If we let our, like, letting our, our decisions in life be based on fear of not being enough, of not being good enough, of not, of not being valued by God enough, like, these decisions will cause us to wreak havoc on the world. Just like the, the, whole, the whole concept of between Cain and Abel. God did not go, Cain did this, Abel did this, yours is better, yours is worse. That was not, that was not God's point. God's point 
was Cain versus Cain, Abel versus Abel. Good job. Do what's right. You see what I'm saying? We can't play the comparison game with each other. We can't let ministry leaders compare each other against each other and say, well, so-and-so has this many people showing up, and so-and-so has this many people showing up, and, or this person brought this many people to Christ, and this person brought this many people to Christ, and so obviously God loves this guy better. Or, you know, uh, you know this guy gets to serve full-time in ministry, but I, I've, got to, I've got to provide for my family, so I'm, I'm, I only get to help out on Sundays. Like, like, when we start comparing ourselves to other people, like, it's going to wreck our story. It's going to wreck God's story. We won't be putting God on display correctly. We, wake up every morning and give God your very best, and there are going to be some days where you didn't do good. There are going to be some days when, when you didn't give God your best. And, and in those days, I'm sorry, God. I'm going to wake up tomorrow, and I'm going to give you my best tomorrow. Don't let those bad days <laughs> become your identity. Go give God your best tomorrow. God doesn't play comparison games. We can't let fear make our decisions for us. God's love is not based on our production. It's not based on how, how many bricks we make, as a friend of mine likes to say. <laughs> right? It's not based on how perfect you can be. It's about who you are and whose you are. And we give God a gift of our obedience and love. And we put him on display correctly and we obey him because it matters. Because when people don't experience God the way he really is, it's, it doesn't make God happy. God is not a tool. When we interact with God, don't interact with God in a way that is idolatrous. And ask the Spirit of God to help you identify things or hearts or desires or anything within yourself that is more idolatrous than it is of God. Partnering with God is never going to be in a way that is manipulative towards God. And so our hearts must be pure. Our reasons must be good. Our, we, we must approach God with humility. If you find today, and this is, this is the invitation, <laughs> if you find today that things in your life are, are kind of squiffy <laughs> and, and, and you're not really sure and, and God starts to identify things that maybe, maybe are quite idolatrous, right? Maybe you find things in your life that are very beast-like where you let desire rule and make the rules and define what's good and evil in your life. It's okay. You can come to God and give it back. You can, you can give him back the beast clothes that you don't need anymore. And you can ask God to clothe you in righteousness, to clothe you in his word, to clothe you in his identity, and to remind you of who you are and whose you are. Repent. Give it back. Identify with the cross. It puts the world back together again. And we can then walk from here and be like God to this world. Start again today. Let's pray. Father, I give you thanks, Lord, for all that you've done and all that you're doing. And I ask for help. Please help. The beast rises up in us, Lord. We don't even notice it. It's hard sometimes when desire rules in our hearts. Father, I pray that you will set us free. Allow us to see what you say is good and to let you define good and evil. Allow us to be full of your spirit, to be like you to this world, to bring peace to the chaos so others can taste and see that you are good. I pray, Father, that you will continue to woo us back to you, Lord, and help us to identify those things that are, that are not like you. And may we surrender that to you. Please continue to teach us your ways. Fill us with your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. If you have a decision to make, please, I invite you to come forward and, as we sing.
This concludes today's worship service. Thank you for listening. We hope you were encouraged by joining us on Facebook Live. Please message us if you have questions or would like more information. May God bless you and give you His peace.